Um, next up will be Alex, so my teammate from Solidity. Alex is actually co-leading the Solidity team and he's also leading the eWASM team, but this talk is going to focus on Solidity. Um, Alex is going to present the future of Solidity, which will entail a feature preview for the upcoming 0.8 release, but I guess also a bit more than that. Hi, Alex. Welcome. Hi there. I'm just still trying to share. Is it shared? Yes, we can see it. Okay, I'm just a bit confused with Zoom. Um, can you also hear me? Yes. Okay, now I can hear you as well. Um, thank you, Franci. Um, Okay, let, let's get through this. So what I'm talking about today is um, a couple of different parts um, regarding solidity. Um, initially, the goal was just to talk about 0.8, um, but if time allows, we'll see. Um, I'm gonna go a bit further than 0.8. Um, but before that, I can actually... Um, so before that, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Uh, we have launched this week a language portal, uh, which can be found on soliditylang.org. Um, and it has all the relevant links to, to everything, including the blog, um, all the different forums, um, the, the releases, um, and also some, some background detail. And I think all of the links I have in, in, in the slides can be found through the, the portal. Now, now, the portal is still in development and it's just the first version um, and we hope to make it um, much more, uh, um, you know, packed with features and, and, and content, um, but that, that's just going to take time. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is this underhanded uh, Solidity coding contest, um, which is a fun little challenge uh, to see if you can hide functionality in the source code. Now, regarding uh, the agenda of today, um, here's another link which also can be found on the portal. Um, it goes through the past five years of Solidity, how the language has changed, um, with a couple of uh, interesting uh, tidbits, um, but we're not gonna talk about that today. Um, I'm gonna have three parts, but depends on how we get on with time. Um, first, the short term uh, part is, uh, I just wanted to, to make clear you know, how the the, the release process works in the team. I know we have mentioned this many, many times already, um, but it never hurts to, to mention it once more. Um, so we try to make uh, really frequent releases, two, three weeks. Um, I know sometimes we, we haven't really gotten to do that and, and maybe it took like six weeks. Um, and in, in case of, of bugs, we do make uh, quicker releases. Um, but I think we are fairly consistent at two, three releases, um, two releases every two, three weeks. Um, and we also try to make breaking releases uh, twice a year. Um, we haven't really done this so far, but maybe this year gonna be the first year we actually achieved that. Uh, so the last breaking release was 0.7 in July, and we hope to have one um, 0.8 by end of this year. And for 0.8, I've collected <clears throat> uh, four interesting features, which um, uh, seem to be uh, becoming part of 0.8. Um, I think some parts may change slightly, um, but I think mostly what I have in these slides is going to be uh, what's included in 08 uh, regarding those. Um, there might be some other smaller or different changes I haven't listed, um, but it, this just isn't time to go through everything. So the first interesting one, uh, I'm sure everybody is, is waiting for this forever by now. Let's start with a simple example here. So uh, what happens in this function if he pass in uh, minus one and one. Um, the function would return one because it wraps around. And why doesn't it just revert? We, we really shouldn't wrap around, one could say. And there's a very simple reason to that um, because Solidity is just exposing what the EVM is doing. We are not trying to add extra code because that costs gas and people don't really like to spend extra gas if they don't need to. Um, but in this particular case, it seems that actually people are willing to spend gas because they don't really want this to happen. Um, and that is signaled by 
the safe math libraries and um, or the safe net library. Well, actually probably there are more of them, um, which pra in practice everybody uses. So the good news is that you may not need to use it anymore in 0.8. Um, so in 0 0.8, we're introducing what's called checked arithmetic by default. Um, so this piece of code here uh, would cause a revert uh, in the previous example. Uh, and this is exactly what safe math is doing. But what if you actually want uh, the overflow, the, the wrapping around behavior? We actually got you covered um, because we have this extra feature here called unchecked. Um, and any piece of code which is uh, uh, wrapped in the unchecked block won't have um, the, the, um, the overflow or underflow checking generated. So those will behave as they were in, in 0 0.7. Um, I haven't really gone through everything here. There are various different edge cases. Uh, so please check the documentation because it's, it's much more than these two slides could cover. But there's another interesting piece here uh, regarding type convergence. Uh, actually, a few weeks ago, I uh, tweeted about what, what do you think is address minus one valid? And initially the, the response, it was a poll. So the initial the response to that um, uh, was what I hoped I'm gonna get is that it's not valid. Uh, but then people actually checked the documentation on Remix and turned out, yes, it is actually code which compiles. So the, the poll ended up saying it's valid code. Um, the reason we found this because, I mean, it's not, not about finding, but the reason it came up as a discussion um, is because we were heavily working on the SMT checker functionality and we wanted to um, properly implement uh, different type conversions. Um, and actually all these little details on this slide and the next slide is the outcome of that review process. And we found that this is rather confusing. Um, so I collected a couple of different strange conversion scenarios here. Um, unfortunately, we are not really uh, interactive, but I gave you two seconds to think what each of these are uh, gonna result in. Okay, um, so these, this is what actually happens. I mean, some of them you could, you could understand it could be said to be intuitive, but I find it rather confusing that we have so many different rules and um, in many cases we, we restrict everything and, and then we have this type conversion mess. Um, luckily, we won't have this type conversion mess anymore. Um, the really interesting part down here is the, the bottom three cases. So depending on uh, just basically this, this very last line here, um, the outcome would depend on the implementation. And by implementation, I mean uh, whether first the sign conversion is taking place uh, on this line or whether the size conversion is taking place first, the outcomes would be different. Um, this is of course not a problem in Solidity because the, um, the order of precedence hasn't changed. Um, neither it did in the new code generator uh, compared to the older one. So nobody has really uh, seen this as an issue. But as we are uh, having more compilers uh, for Solidity and more people looking into Solidity, uh, if this is not well specified, then this could become a problem. Um, but there just doesn't seem to be any reason to support this functionality. So we actually just removed it. Um, so all of these weird cases here, with the exception of this valid address, uh, all of these are becoming invalid. Um, so basically the literal has to be, um, the literal is this here. So it has to be um, less or equal to the bit bit of the type and the signs must match the type. Um, and by this, I mean that if it's an unsigned type, there's not possible to assign a sign number to it. Um, it's only possible to assign it to sign numbers. Uh, we do have one exception is address zero because that's, that's really useful and it's used very frequently. Um, now another, I think extremely important piece is panic codes. 
And you will see that this is actually connected quite a bit to the stuff previously discussed. Um, so currently, um, there are two different ways where code can abort. Uh, and the one case is where the code is gonna have an invalid opcode. And that means that all gas is going to be consumed. Um, and the second case is where we have a revert opcode. Um, and of course, this only applies after um, Constantinople or Byzantium. Anyway, um, this has been introduced a couple of years ago, but it hasn't been there initially. Um, so basically there are two ways to abort execution uh, with failure. One case is with the invalid opcode when all gas is consumed. And the second case is the re revert opcode where the remaining gas is kept. Um, there's another main difference between these two is that with revert, it is possible to send a message um, uh, to the caller. Um, and that message could explain why did we abort. Um, now, this is what we have uh, today before 08. And in many cases, invalid opcode would be used uh, internally, um, and this is changing. Now, just a bit more explanation what, what reverts are. Um, um, so this case, like with the require statement, uh, which I'm sure everybody is aware of that, of course, uses the revert of code. Um, and actually what happens here is that we have an encoding for this message. We are not just putting this message into the, the, the revert message, rather we encapsulate it. And we encapsulate it with uh, the ABI encoding. Um, and, and practically it just looks like a, a function call. So the, the, the error function, which has a string and then we just encode the message. Um, so one could say that this uh, expression here, uh, this statement, the required statement would equal uh, to this one. So it's just a weird way to, to encode the same thing. Um, so we have um, these error messages and now we're introducing a second case, um, the panic uh, messages. And a panic message is basically any kind of uh, internal error uh, is uh, emitted as a panic message. So the main benefit we get here is that we are not going to consume uh, all the gas. And second, we are able to deduce from the outside why did the execution stopped. I didn't list here all the different panic codes. Um, and I think it's still possible to argue whether the code should be different because the release hasn't really come out yet. Um, but we do have, um, I think I'm missing three or four more because there just wasn't enough space on the slide. Um, it's however documented um, in the, the breaking branch. Um, so it's possible to, to still discuss these error codes, but this is roughly what they mean. Um, there is a specific error code for manually uh, calling a cert. Uh, there is a specific error code uh, for under or, or overflow. Uh, obviously that's outside of the unchecked um, blocks. Uh, there is a specific one for division or modulo by zero. Um, there's specific one for out of bounds access and type conversion. There's also for, for um, uh, trying to allocate too much memory, et cetera. There are a bunch of different error codes. Um, I actually invite all of you guys to, to check the documentation and, and maybe give some feedback um, because it would be bad to you know, hard code these and then uh, next release people wanted to change them. Um, and the fourth big change, um, I think is the ABI encoder V2, uh, what changes related to it. Now, maybe I, I should just give a first um, explanation what the hell ABI encoder V2 is. I'm sure many of you do know what it is, but maybe some others don't. Um, so it has been introduced uh, in 2017, so quite a while ago. Um, and the ABI encoder is this piece of code which, um, which generates the code to decode and encode uh, all the, the inputs and outputs from a contract. So when somebody is, is sending data to a contract, it's encoded into this ABI data structure and that needs to be decoded and any response has to be encoded. And the compiler um, has two implementations uh, of this uh, code generator. The one is, um, I guess, ABI encoder v1 and the other one is ABI encoder v2. 
Um, the main difference from the old one uh, is that V2 generates yield code. And the V1 just generates EVM bytecode. So it's, it's kind of hard to, to work with. Um, so the yield code is, is much better maintainable. Um, and it also supports more types. And probably that's the reason some of you have used it um, because it does support uh, various um, features from structs which are not supported by the old ABI encoder. Um, but some of you may have also noticed that uh, this V2 is a bit more strict than the old one. And in some cases it may consume more gas. Um, and this gas question may have been more, more uh, relevant um, I guess early on when this was introduced, um, but especially last year, we have worked, um, by last year I mean 2019, and early this year we have worked quite a bit on the optimization capabilities for you. Um, so I think actually the gas costs are not all that much off uh, compared to the old one, uh, but it is way more strict. Um, and because this, um, it was a second encoder, it had to be um, enabled by choice. Um, so we had this um, experimental pragma uh, for ABI encoder v2. And for a long while, um, I mean, this has to be added in the source code. In every single source code, you want to use it. Um, and if a, a given source code doesn't have it uh, and you mix these together, um, that is also working. Um, and then for a long while, whenever anyone specified this experimental pragma, the metadata also had an experimental flag to signal that this may not be uh, production ready software. Um, however, we have removed this experimental flag from the metadata uh, last year with the 06 release, but we still kept the, the experimental pragma. And now with 08, we are changing this. It is going to be enabled by default. Um, but for those who still want to use the old one, which I don't see any reason to, but if you still want to use the old one, you can do that. Um, we are introducing a new pragma here called ABI encoder. Uh, and it has two options, V1 and V2. So if you want to keep using the old version, you have to introduce this extra line. Um, you can also explicitly use this new one, but it is enabled by default. Um, and to make life a tiny bit easier, um, probably we are going to keep uh, supporting the experimental pragma, um, but it's going to emit a warning. Now, that is all about the 08 uh, I wanted to highlight, but there's, of course, a lot more. Um, we have a project in GitHub. I haven't linked here, um, but I guess I can show it through the QA if you have time. Um, and that project we use to uh, rank and sort different proposals and discuss them. Um, and that project is just basically working off these labels. Um, what I'm trying to show here is that uh, we have two important labels we work with, uh, the language design and the breaking change. And you can see that there are 126 open language design uh, issues. So that's quite a bit of changes. Um, and that means, of course, these four changes I mentioned are not the only ones which we are discussing. Um, obviously, it's not possible to discuss all the 126 changes uh, you know, every week, but we do pick uh, from these issues. Um, and here I picked actually four different issues um, I wanted to highlight, which are important, at least in my opinion, uh, in the medium term. So whatever I said regarding 0 0.8 is, um, is probably what we agreed on as a team, but this part of the talk is, is more like an opinion piece. It, it's not like a final decision from the team and, and I'm not trying to, to make it look like so. Um, but I think these four issues I'm gonna briefly talk about are really interesting and important for the future. Um, I'm sure you have heard about this solidity to you code generator for a long while because we have been saying this for years that yeah, we're gonna have this you will code generator done. And um, yeah, actually we are quite close to that. Um, so we have a project board, a separate project board, not the one I mentioned, um, just for this solidity to you will code generator. Um, and this project board is becoming rather empty. Um, 
So it would have like five different columns from icebox to in progress to in review uh, to done. And we only have a, a handful of issues in the icebox and over 50 issues in the done. Um, but unfortunately, it's still not 100% uh, complete. Um, we have two major things to finish. One is, is support for libraries and, and some cases of copying between memory and storage. Um, however, we at the same time trying to maybe consider moving off libraries. So I'm not sure what, what, what's gonna happen with this here. The main goal of, of uh, having this sold to yield conversion is to have better maintainability. Um, and also because the ABI encoder v2 generates Yule, um, it, it provides a much better integration. Um, so one could imagine um, that if, uh, if you're using this salt to Yule and ABI encoder v2, then we have the entire contract generated in Yule and we can apply optimizations on Yule itself. Then we can um, translate that Yule code to EVM and then we can also apply optimizations on the EVM bytecode. Um, compared to that today, uh, it's a bit different um, because if you compile directly to EVM um, in the compiler and then use the ABI encoder v2, what that means is one needs to compile the, the ABI encoder v2 output to EVM and then consider the EVM code. Um, so by moving uh, to this um, intermediate step, we're gonna have much better um, possibilities for optimization. And it also going to finally give uh, some solution to the stack 2 deep error. Um, there is actually a piece of code implemented called the memory escalator, uh, which can move um, variables from the stack into memory and, and, and back and forth. Um, and that is implemented on Yule. Um, so hopefully that is also gonna be fixed by this. Um, I don't really give any deadline when this is gonna happen, but um, yeah, we're really hoping to, to get this down uh, fairly quickly. Um, so this salt to yield project, um, this feature can already compile a, a bunch of contracts. It can compile the Uniswap um, um, factory as well, I believe. Um, and it can also compile the E2 uh, de deposit contract. And it can almost compile the Gnosis safe and the multi-sig wallet. There's only just one feature missing in each. Um, another, um, I think rather interesting um, functionality we are uh, discussing, and here's the link for the discussion, is enums, no, not with metadata. <laughs> um, yeah, enums uh, with data or algebraic data types. Um, so here's, here's a, a small example. Um, as you can see, we are using the, the enum syntax um, and it is possible to, to have various, um, oh, why, why is the, Okay. Um, yeah, there should be a, a column, um, a semicolon there, a comment there. Um, um, anyway, this is the current syntax. This is not implemented. This is only under discussion. Um, I think what I wanted to to actually highlight here. So you should rather just go to the, the issue because it's um, a lot to discuss. Um, but this is a simple example. Um, and what can be uh, I guess seen in the next slide is that we don't have a syntax for matching yet. So basically one would need to have a long uh, if else chain uh, to evaluate all the different types. Um, and the current conversation is really uh, just focusing on, on how to encode this uh, in, in the ABI and the storage. Um, and I guess once we have that done, then we could talk about the matching, but anybody is invited to, to come up with any suggestions. And especially I would be interested to see if, if anybody is really interested in this functionality and how would you use it. Um, another really uh, highly debated topic is the templates. Um, I think this issue was created in 2016, so it, it uh, or maybe even 2015, so it, it exists for a long time and it has been discussed uh, for a long while. Uh, on the issue, actually, there are a couple of links to different uh, GitHub guests or gists, uh, which have a vari variety of examples. Um, and I'm not gonna go into too deep into that, but here's a simple example from uh, how to do um, typecasting. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a, a weird example, um, but it shows the syntax. I mean, it's nothing really uh, strange or 
unfamiliar. It's, it's kind of similar to C++ and Rust. Um, what we are more, um, I guess, busy with regarding templates is writing more examples to, to find potential problems. Um, and by doing so, we also figured that we would need a lot of different introspection helpers for types. Um, and this is somewhat related. Uh, standard library is, um, is something we also, this is like the fourth topic, we also have heavily discussed. Um, I, want to, I want to make sure everybody understands you're not trying to compete with Open Zeppelin. Um, so it's not a standard library for ERCs and, and higher level uh, protocols and um, functionality. It's rather a standard library for moving more features uh, from outside of the compiler code base um, and to also maybe decouple the EVM specific behavior uh, a bit more from the compiler. Um, I gave you two different examples. Um, so one thing what could happen with uh, having a standard library is uh, removing the need for global functions uh, we have. Um, now this here, it doesn't really say anything more where, where this uh, standard library lives. It just means that by default in the namespace, there wouldn't be an EC recover as it is today, but rather it has to be explicitly imported. Um, and one could imagine that maybe this standard library would be still part of the compiler. And all this means is just cleaning up the namespace, um, which is I think already uh, a useful uh, step to make. Um, but we could also implement some of these helpers in Solidity itself. Um, this is an actual implementation for EC recover. Um, even if it doesn't look nice, um, but it is possible to move um, functionality out of the compiler. And I think this is gonna be some of the, the really interesting steps to do. And um, some of these examples I gave prior, uh, uh, like the templates and algebraic data types, these actually play quite well into the standard library discussion. And now we got to the very end is what the, the long-term uh, gonna be like for Solidity. Um, so this just has a bunch of different questions. Um, and I feel I have some answers to them, but I'm, I, I don't think we have enough time for that. Um, but one question is, will we have different targets or, or different dialects of the language? Uh, will we support uh, rollups, different rollup systems um, uh, uh, in the compiler? Will we support some kind of sharding uh, or will we support uh, EWASM? Um, just a brief answer is uh, what I discussed about this sol -Yule, um stage is that Yule is an intermediate language uh, which not only can, out, can be converted into EVM, but it can be converted into other bytecodes as well. Um, so internally in the compiler, we have a piece which converts it into EWASM or just WebAssembly. Um, but we also had a, a discussion with the, the OVM team and it would be possible to translate it into OVM bytecode. However, that hasn't been implemented. Um, and the importance of dialects or targets would be to uh, have the capability to disable features in the, the, the source code, which would be specific to a different uh, specific target. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if we have time maybe for one question, uh, but I think I filled out the 30 minutes. Um, so yeah, that's that's what's uh, I guess next for Solidity. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, we are uh, perfectly on time, so we don't have that much time uh, left for questions. But um, I wanna ask one question before we wrap it up. Um, so basically, all of this was more or less about the future language design of Solidity. Um, are you currently happy about the? setup and process how it's working or if you could make a wish who would you uh, wish to have participate in the language design more everyone <laughs> um yeah i think definitely um the participants we have today is uh, mostly auditors and um some people who have been around in in uh, ethereum quite a long time and um, and maybe those people who have been around since 2016 uh, when the, the community was tiny and they, they don't really feel anxious to, to reach out to the projects because they feel like they're on the same level. Um, and I would encourage everyone that, you know, we are not like some, some, some weirdos hidden somewhere. We are just like you. So we'd like to talk to you, you know, whether you start your first hackathon or whether <clears throat> you have deployed your DeFi project, we want feedback from all of you guys. 
that are nice closing words. Thanks so much, Alex.